Jordan Peterson and Alex O'Connor, a.k.a. Cosmic Skeptic, had a friendly conversation about religion, and they began the discussion by sharing their thoughts on skepticism, its uses and abuses. As they came to an agreement on the proper use of skepticism, I started thinking about all the young atheists who needed to hear from this Canadian-British tag team. And later, I realized how helpful it might be if more conversations began with a little groundwork on skepticism. Because a person's degree of skepticism is going to play a significant role in the rest of the discussion. So, why not prepare the ground a bit? There's a link to the full discussion in the description box. Let's go through their brief exchange on skepticism. Jordan gets things rolling by asking Alex about the name Cosmic Skeptic. So let's start with this, Cosmic Skeptic. Right, okay, so how do you come up with the name and, and, and why the conjunction and what's, what, what do you think the advantage is, if any, in relationship to the emphasis on skepticism? Alex responds by giving the official story and the unofficial story. You can guess which one is true. The official story is that cosmic sort of implies universe, space, big thinking. And skeptic uh, sort of situates me within a tradition of people who are interested in interrogating their beliefs uh, mm -hmm. to their sort of fundamental, uh, fundamental grounding insofar as that's possible. And skeptic is spelt with a K because most of my American, most of my listeners are, are American. British people like to be different. So they spell skeptic with an SC instead of with the authentic American SK, like they drive on the wrong side of the road and on the wrong side of the car. Alex's official story is that he spelled it with a K for the sake of his American viewers. Now the unofficial story. The unofficial answer is that uh, when I was younger, I knew a guy who was a musician and started a SoundCloud account with the word cosmic in it. And I thought, hey, that sounds like a cool word. And I was starting a YouTube channel and wanted sound something that sounded cool. And I thought skeptic sounded cool next to it. And I spelled it with a K because I got it wrong. No, you got it right by accident. But if Alex was wrong about that, what else is he wrong about? I see. Okay, okay. Well, well, who knows the actual derivation? And it's a good combination, though, because it, it, well, it's catchy, so that's nice from a marketing side, but it's it also has this, it's an interesting allusion to the combination of revelation and critical thinking that actually makes up actual thinking. A combination of revelation and critical thinking that makes up actual thinking. Jordan isn't talking about revelation in the religious sense of divine revelation. I think he just means that there's a vast array of ideas that are presented to us, and critical thinking is how you process these ideas. The problem with being concerned with a vast plethora of ideas is that many ideas are misleading and wrong. And so you have to learn how to combine that openness and curiosity with the capacity to separate the wheat from the chaff. Separating wheat from chaff. That's Jordan's picture of critical thinking. Skepticism would be like a tool that's used for winnowing. So, you get a bundle of wheat, the chaff is the casing around the grain. You crush the wheat to break the casing, and then you use something like a winnowing fork to toss everything into the air. And the grain is heavier, so it falls back to the threshing floor, while the chaff blows away. So, in this analogy, skepticism would be one of the tools, like the winnowing fork. But there's a problem with skepticism. Yeah. And that's the utility of skepticism. I mean, it can degenerate into a kind of argumentative nihilism. That's the downside. Skepticism can degenerate into argumentative nihilism. In other words, if it's not used properly, it's just used to attack ideas and not to separate good ideas from bad ideas. So, if skepticism is like a winnowing fork, instead of using the winnowing fork to separate the wheat from the chaff, you use it to stab the pile of wheat. You never get anything valuable out of it, and you eventually starve, intellectually and perhaps spiritually. But properly applied, it, it, uh, it separates the wheat from the chaff, right? And the purpose of that is to keep the wheat. 
The purpose of skepticism is not to destroy positions you don't like. The purpose of skepticism is to ultimately get to good ideas. And now for Alex's picture of skepticism. Well, skepticism can only ever be essentially destructive because you're being skeptical of something. Somebody's putting something forward and you're sort of responding to that with skepticism. And so for a lot of people, if, if skepticism is the thing that you do, then you sort yeah. of end up chipping away and ending up with nothing, whereas skepticism is really supposed to be a tool that you use. It, it, it is destructive, but in the way that you might sort of um, carve a piece of marble. Yeah, you're, right. You're intending to get yes. a statue out of it. At the yes, end. yes. Well, that's the thing to always keep in mind. It's yeah. skepticism in the service of something. Exactly. Yeah, it's a right. tool. It's a methodological right. tool. Alex uses a completely different analogy, but he and Jordan have the same view. Skepticism is a tool. For Alex, it's like a chisel. You've got a block of marble. You use the chisel to chip away at the marble, but not just for the sake of getting rid of chunks of marble. Your goal is to make something. So the statue would be a good idea or even a complete worldview, and skepticism would be the tool that helps you get rid of pieces that aren't part of that good idea or worldview. I like both their analogies, especially since skepticism has become so weaponized in recent years. There are lots of people running around with a winnowing fork or a chisel and just stabbing everything they see. And that's not what those tools are meant for. Skepticism is extremely easy to weaponize because it's very easy to raise or lower your level of skepticism. If you don't want to believe in something, you can dial up your skepticism so that nothing ever counts as evidence. If you do want to believe in something, you can lower your level of skepticism so that anything counts as conclusive proof. To be fair, everyone does this to some extent. Once you have your worldview, whatever that may be, when something comes along that conflicts with your worldview, you're probably going to be more skeptical. When something comes along that fits in rather nicely with your worldview, you're probably going to be less skeptical. Again, we all do this to some extent. It's a perfectly normal part of human reasoning. But there are two important things to keep in mind. One, we're all wrong about certain things. We're all right about certain things, but we're all wrong about certain things. So, when some new idea is presented to you, and it conflicts with something else you believe, you want to keep in mind that you may be wrong, so that you don't just dial your skepticism up and automatically reject the new idea. Two, you don't want to dial up your skepticism so much that nothing can ever qualify as evidence against your position. If skepticism is measured on a scale of from 1 to 10, let's say, 1 meaning you're so completely gullible that you'll believe anything with no evidence whatsoever, and 10 meaning you're so thoroughly self-assured that you'll automatically reject any evidence no matter how strong, you don't want to simply raise your skepticism level up to 10 and then run around insisting that there's no evidence against you. Who can forget the Oxford atheist Peter Atkins saying that even if God wrote him a message in the stars, he still wouldn't believe in God? You know, is I there think... any kind of evidence in the universe that could make... I mean, if the stars lined up to spell, Peter, please believe in me, it's about no, time. I, 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 would, I, put that it, I put it down to madness. Even if he died and woke up in heaven, he still wouldn't believe. Well, what would persuade I, you? I can't conceive of... Uh, I suppose even if I died and was confronted with you know, St. Peter saying, welcome to heaven, <laughs> um, I'd probably think I was dreaming. Who can forget Richard Dawkins and Peter Boghossian agreeing that nothing can ever prove God's existence because any evidence can be explained away by hallucinations or by blaming powerful alien tricksters. If you, even if there was this, this booming voice and the second coming in clouds of glory, the more probable explanation is that it's a hallucination or right. a right. conjuring trick by David Copperfield or right. something. Um, you know, if you walked out and there were these globes that were spinning around that said, you know, I am God, believe in me, or the famous Krauss thing, you walk out into the sky and it spells out in the stars in different languages, I am God, believe in me. Well, again, the problem is it could be a delusion, but the other problem is 
you'd have to rule out alternative explanations, like the aliens. Well, I mean, there could be an alien trickster culture or something. Huh? We're going to get those little humans. Any, any aliens who could actually visit us would have to be so far beyond us in their technology that they probably could manipulate the stars to, to um, spell out words. So what would, what would persuade you? Well, I'm starting to think nothing would. Who can forget Matt Dillahunty admitting that even if someone he knew was dead suddenly appeared to him and shared information that the person couldn't possibly have known apart from something supernatural, Matt still wouldn't believe in the supernatural. So here's my question for you. I gave you that example of the beheading. I'm beheaded up here. Everybody's out of the auditorium. You've already seen my headless corpse. I come walking out an hour later, and you all see me alive, and I testify that I met someone in heaven, and they shared with me a private conversation that they had had with you that you know is, is correct. Now, wouldn't our understanding that that is impossible by natural causes, wouldn't that justify you to infer that a supernatural event has indeed occurred? Yeah, so I, I like this question because it proposes the very thing that never happens. Uh, well, there's let, a lot so of things. So we, 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 it goes to the extreme to say, ah, if, we could de if, we, if this happened, would you then accept that there's a supernatural explanation? And the short answer is no. I've never seen anyone weaponize skepticism as successfully as the new atheists. A universe comes into existence. That's no evidence. The properties of that universe are finely tuned for life. No evidence. Life forms. No evidence. Human consciousness arises. No evidence. Hundreds of millions of people are convinced that they've witnessed miracles. No evidence. Near-death experiences. No evidence. Moral laws and logical laws and mathematics, whatever they are, they're abstract and conceptual. They only exist in a mind. And yet they're real, independent of any human mind. So where does that put them? No evidence. The new atheists run around screaming, where's your evidence? Where's your proof? Prove to me that God exists but they don't seem to realize that all they've been taught is how to play skeptic. And it's really easy to play skeptic. It's really easy to dial your skepticism up to 10 and then say, there's no evidence. Of course, the people who taught the new atheists to play skeptic are people who've constructed a worldview that's impervious to evidence. So the leaders of the new atheism dial their skepticism up to 10 so that nothing can ever prove them wrong. Then they program a generation of atheists to do the same thing. And then they send these atheists into the world to scream, where's the evidence? We don't see any evidence. That's not the purpose of skepticism, my friends. Skepticism is a tool to help you get to the truth, not a weapon for hacking away at ideas you don't like. Some say that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I say that insanity is constructing a worldview that's impervious to evidence and then running around demanding evidence. In short, to all you atheists and agnostics out there, try to be more like Alex O'Connor, the cosmic skeptic, and less like Richard Dawkins, the galactic argumentative nihilist as Jordan Peterson might put it.